to the uh, 17th round table sponsored by the Bonner Milltown History Center. Is that better? <laughs> I can't seem to get it apart. I think the whole thing. Uh, and I want to let you know that the next one will be on uh, March 16th here uh, on the Bonner School. So I hope you'll all put that on your calendars and plan to attend. Uh, Kim Brigman is here. At, I think he could say a few words about an upcoming conference on the Mullen Road. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, we have the annual um, Mullen Road Conference is scheduled for May 2nd through 4th in Missoula this year. It's been in various places along the, the Mullen Road from Walla Walla to Fort Benton. And this year it's Missoula's turn to host it. Um, and there will be more information um, distributed as the time approaches. But that's May 2nd through 4th. Thanks, Kim. Um, I want to say thanks to St. Anne's uh, Roman Catholic Church for letting us use their facility here, which is great, and to MCAT for filming it, and uh, for Riley Sladen for providing the sound system. Um, and this is a, the topic of Hughes Gardens is a uh, topic that, as, as we've gotten into it, uh, we've discovered that there's conflicting views, uh, bits of knowledge about it, and uh, we're, so we're beginning to pull information together. We got information from the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula, Stan Cohen, Jim Hobbeck, Kim Brigman, and Norm Jacobson all found some wonderful pictures which are on the wall over there. Um, so, and there's also some uh, written information. Uh, one of the things that's a little confusing is what date the gardens actually ended. And um, you'll see one of the articles says 65, but most people think it was in the 70s. So there, there are bits of information still to be found. Um, and one of the questions that maybe they'll get uh, a little more light on is uh, Missoula is known as the Garden City and Hughes Gardens was clearly a part of that but there were gardens before uh, Hughes the big picture on the second panel there shows one of the early gardens in 1898 um, anyway there's going to be lots more and we we'll hope that you'll all participate uh, with if you worked at Hughes Gardens or know something about it to add to our information here and so I'll turn it over to Glenn Smith who will carry okay. on. <laughs> we'll, we'll kick it over. Okay you guys hearing me out there? Ed, how about you in the back row? Yeah. Okay. Now uh for Hughes Gardens, I didn't come into Hughes Gardens until in the, about the mid-50s. And the reason for that, uh, my motivation was, that during that time I had a newspaper route out here that was providing me with a little bit of income, but not what I determined I was going to need for the next adventure in my life. Uh, that adventure was, <clears throat> to purchase myself a hunting rifle and to learn how to hunt. <laughs> now, with Ed back there, I think Ed probably remembers Yankee Doodle Rock. I did get the gun. I worked for uh, uh, a dollar a day for a nine hour day. And uh, I think Saginaw. Anyway, for this nine hour day, why? For a buck a day, it took me a little over two weeks, and I had me a, a 303 British Lee Enfield Super Razoo World War I Army Rifle <laughs> with a bunch of armor-piercing ammunition. <laughs> and boy, there was sheep mountain up there, man. I was going to walk up that thing and just blast everything that come along. <coughs> and did I find out uh, that just wasn't the way it was going to be. And if you want to know about Yankee Doodle Rock, I think you need to get a hold of Ed back here. He was one of the major participants in Yankee Doodle Rock. 
and the fact that my old British rifle wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. Anyway, when I got the job, I went out there to apply for the appointment, and uh, right off the bat, I get out there early, and right off the bat, here comes Ben Hughes. And I thought, well, <clears throat> I've had a lot of experience out here with our Victory Gardens. Donna, you remember Victory Gardens. Okay, Ed, you remember Victory Gardens. We cut through uh, Ed and Shirley's yard lot just to get over to the garden spots. But uh, anyway, I had a little bit of experience with gardening. Plus, took care of some flower gardens along the houses out here. Uh, this is at a time when Bonner only has a sawmill. The big Victory Gardens is on the east end of it. Most of these little houses out here were connected with board sidewalks. So, give you an idea of what it was like in that part of the 50s. Okay, I go down. I figure I've got all the, all the skills necessary. I'm going to walk into this Hughes Gardens thing, and I'm going to get me a top pay a job, and I'm going to be cool, and this is the way it's going to be. I meet Ben. My first impressions of Ben was he was a cranky old butter. <laughs> it looked like he had a case of heartburn or something all the time. So I told him who it was and what I wanted. He says, we'll be here uh, tomorrow. Uh, we start at 8 o'clock around here, and we don't quit till 6. So I went out there. When I came on board that next morning, uh, I found out that Ben had a brother named Harry. And Harry was the complete opposite of Ben. He was kind of a happy-go-lucky guy. He also took care of the Mexican laborers. And that's a whole other story. I'll get to that part a little later. But the guy that, that uh, I liked and I think everybody else thought the world of was a fellow named Bill Manthe. Bill was like an athletic coach with kids. He had a natural gift to make you want to perform the, to the, your best abilities. So we all liked Bill. He was good with maintaining the equipment. He could plant a row out there, a seed bed of radishes that was as straight as a, as a quilt, you know, box in a quilt. He was quite a guy. Uh, soil maintenance out there, I think probably we're looking all today towards organic gardening. But I think Hughes was into organic, in fact, they were into organic gardening long before it became popular now. Because I do have some stories to tell about collecting some of this animal byproduct. <laughs> what I thought of that. <laughs> okay, we had a structure out there. There was a lot of plants that you needed to raise up that uh, the plant couldn't reach maturity with the growing season we had. So we had this contraption, it, uh, we called it a hotbed. It was kind of like a long, rectangular, single pitch shed with a glass roof. It was dug into the ground. I have a diagram over here on the board. We'd fill that bottom portion of that up with uh, the atom of manure, get some water to it, get it fermenting to generate heat. Then we would put the bedding soil back in, plant it, and put these glass covers over the top. They were called hotbeds. This give plants like tomatoes, cabbage, peppers, those type of plants, the head start that they needed to reach maturity with this growing season that we had. So some of the crops out here that we raised, uh, Donna, you'll, you'll recall some of these, Sharon, Joyce, the, uh, the radish patch, the onion patch, those gals, hey, you say ladies are the, the fairer sex, they're as damn tough as we are, if not tougher. <laughs> to sit out there in those conditions and work under that hot sun like that was something else. In fact, so much that uh, I remember when my wife first applied for work out there, she got to slap me alongside the head for this one. She come in to, to apply for a job. It was her and Joyce come down together after high school. Applying for a job. Well, old Ben sent me up there. He says, I need you to go up and get me a couple of pounds of rhubarb. i got a gal coming down. She likes some nice red rhubarb. So get her big stocks, lots of red. 
cut the top off so you get a little bit of webbing up there. So I went up, cut the rhubarb, and he says, by the way, pick up some parsley while you're there. She wants parsley. So I'm up there uh, taking care of that little chore, and Joyce and Sharon come down. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> this is going to be something. They ain't never going to last out here. <laughs> I guess we showed them, didn't we? <laughs> boy, did they show me. I told Ben, I said, this is, this is not going to work. This would be like throwing that light in the wind. These poor gals ain't going to be able to handle it. They handled it, let me tell you. 54 years later, she's still handling this old loudmouth. <laughs> so, that gets me more into the, the workforce out there. There was, uh, it was mainly teenagers, but there was a good size uh, Mexican labor force out there, and also some tractor operators. Now, my first go around on a tractor to plow, I thought, hell, you just get on this thing, give it a good throttle, drop that plow in, and start turning dirt. No. What I wound up doing was plowing the center of the patch out so it was like a basin. The irrigating water couldn't run through it right. So Ben come out, and uh, the way Ben had with words, he told me that I didn't know jack about running a tractor. So I better do something else. Okay, the, the Mexican laborers out there, I had a vague idea as a kid what Mexican laborers were like. But when I got out there, I found out real quick. They were a hard-working bunch, but they spoke a language which was different to me. I did learn it. I think one of the first things I learned from them in order to speak Spanish was I would pick up like this cup and I would say, como se dice in inglés, red solo cup. Well, they would, they would interpret that into Spanish and that's the way I remember it. I did that with uh, just about everything there was. So I'm thinking, man, am I cool or what? I can speak this really good language. Well, I got into high school. And my Spanish teacher asked me, or asked the whole class to demonstrate if they knew any of the Spanish language. And I rattled off what I thought was impeccable Spanish. And she was ready to throw me right out the door. We don't talk like that around here. I don't know where you learned that, but this ain't the way we're going to teach it. So, so much for, so much for the, the Mexican. The equipment that they had out there, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, ben and Harry seemed to pre prefer the Chrysler product. Dodge trucks, cars. Harry drove an old Plymouth Suburban. But you could always tell Harry in the back end was full of hobo, shovels, yeah, all kinds of uh, gardening tools he kept back there. And an old fellow named Squire Hughes. Uh, all bent over hell. He must have been in his 90s then. Come to find out he was uh, Ben and Harry's dad and was, I think, the city, first city attorney for Missoula. Anyway, getting back to the equipment. They had two ton and a half Dodges with big boxes on the back. The box side boards would drop down so you could load just about anything you wanted in there. So from vegetables to uh, I'll talk a little bit about the animal byproduct and uh, whatever needed to be hauled, you could haul it. Uh, he did have an old Chevrolet dump truck. That old Chevy had a steel box on the back of that dump box. The reason for that is we hauled beer hops from the Highlander Brewery. Now, those stored things might make a good beer, but after they sit a while, you know, they get very aromatic. But anyway, we'd, we'd load up a dripping glob of these beer hops, bring them out, you know, and spread them in the fields. So in the spring of the year, when you went through Hellgate Canyon, you know, you almost had to kind of hold your nose a little bit, because they were pretty ripe, and he liked them. That's where he liked to spread them, was right out through, beside the highway, going out towards East Missoula. 
A tractor that he preferred was the Alice Chalmers. He had two little cultivator type tractors. And Dennis, Dennis can recall, uh, I think you were telling me, one of them is being restored. So you put Bill Matthew on the board of one of those little cultivators with, with a seed planting apparatus, and Bill could plant a patch out there, and it was amazing. There was another little cultivator that was used a larger Ellis Chalmers, and there were two crawler type tractors made by, I believe, Oliver. Those were Oliver's. One was called a Clee Track, it was the newer of the two, bright yellow, and the other was kind of a army drab green color. And they used those mainly for plowing because, you know, the spring of the year that dirt was kind of tough to turn up. Didn't he have a couple horses too? He had one old horse out there, that poor old horse died. I don't know, should I tell that story? The doggone horse died. We had to load him up on one of these Dodge trucks. We got the front end loader right on, on the bigger Alice Chalmers, loaded the horse up. Tell him what the horse did. <laughs> Didn't it plow? Oh yeah, but they used him for uh, cultivating corn because he could walk down the corn rows without knocking them down like a tractor would. Well, anyway, the horse died. We had to pick him up, take him out to the rendering plant. And uh, we got him out there just about noontime. <laughs> and where do we put the horse? Well, ask that guy. So we went out and asked Joe Schmuckerini or whatever his name was. Where do we put the horse? Well, Joe didn't want to be interrupted. He was eating his lunch. Had his lunch bucket spread out. Was eating his lunch on top of a dead, very bloated, Black Angus cow. So between that and the horse and my ravenous appetite, it went out the window. But after that, I wanted no more of, of the dead animals. So that's what happened to the horse. Okay, we did produce a lot of uh, vegetables out there that was left over from when the harvest was in. Products like cabbage, which was turned into sauerkraut. They made some pickles out there. I don't remember the, the, the pickle man's full name, but it was Gus. And uh, he could make a pickle that, to die for. They were the big pickles that was put on a popsicle stick. You could get those at the old stop and shop. I think you could get them at fairs. But they were good. Pickle on a stick type thing. Uh, Gus would take Gus would take the barrels that he put these pickles up in. He would take the barrel all apart, and some of them that leaked pretty bad. He would take a cattail, put it between the wooden staves to form a seal to keep them from leaking. Then we would smear. Uh, this is where I come in. You crawl into the barrel, and you smear wax in to further ensure against leakage. Well, then he put his secret pickle recipe in there, which I never did find out what it was, but it was a lot of pickles, salt. Uh, he put, he even put choke cherries in there. Just about everything you can imagine he put in there. But when they, they were ready to go toward long towards the spring of the year, they were to die for. Uh, the sauerkraut, that was quite a, quite an operation. Donna, Betts worked with us in the sauerkraut, and uh, that was uh, quite quite an operation. We would take the field sun split cabbages and we would cut the bad parts off, core them out with a device made out of an old oil can, a piece of dowel rod, so it was like an auger. Ram that in there and cut that core out. Passed it down the production table. It went into a shredder, where it was shredded, dumped into a bin. From the bin, there was a quart can of, uh, it was an oil can cleaned out, but it was a major for the salt. That was poured in there. Manthe, Bill Manthe, or one of the guys would, would stir that up. And then we had stompers, which was a piece, about an eight inch in diameter piece of uh, lodgepole. In the center of that was a hole handle pounded down into it. 
This was our stomper. The round piece of lodge pole was waxed. So you stomp this sauerkraut, this shredded cabbage, down into the barrel. And you continue this process until the barrel was full. At that point, it was covered with a piece of cloth, an X-shaped board contraption with a big rock on top of it. That held everything down as it progressed and fermented through the winter. Okay, by this time we're getting close to the end of the year and uses. So if you stuck it out, you survived it. <laughs> he did pay a bonus, which I used my bonus to get me through the high school years for extra spending money. It wasn't much, but back then you didn't need a whole heck of a lot. So you got your bonus, and then he would spring for a barbecue picnic up past Clinton here at the old Nimrod Hot Springs. And that's where we, we said our farewells, and we uh, uh, we went to high school, we went to college, where, wherever we were going at the time. Okay, that's kind of a rundown of, uh, of Hughes Gardens. We'll take now and break this down even a little further. To what actually we did out there. Now, like I say, my my I got started out thinking I could fit right in here because I've got gardening experience. And uh, what I left at Bonner at the time was a lifestyle that was very close to Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. You know, and now I'm shoved out into the workforce, and <laughs> that's. That's altogether different. And my wage at Bonner was if I could pull the weeds out of Mrs. Shannon's garden, I got 10 cents, which I promptly went up to the soda fountain and invested in an orange sherbet ice cream cone. But now I've got ideas, I've got designs on more, more income. So this is where where Hughes Gardens comes in. The one thing I did find out, poor Ben, might have been why he was so cranky. I think I might have mentioned this earlier. His name was Byron Longfellow Tennyson Hughes. Well, had a like that. Write that a hundred times on a blackboard and see if you don't get cranky. So, uh, I guess he was born about 1895. Maybe that was what made him cranky, I don't know. He started his working career with a newspaper route. I had one, I thought, boy, you and me, we're close. We got newspaper routes. Ah, that didn't carry any weight. I did have, eventually get the distributorship for eastern part of the state, so for about eight years I run that. Okay, what I'd like to do now is, uh, Ron here, he's sitting there, Don, wrote your name down too, I still get a call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he worked there also, and he's co-hosting this thing. I suppose you're getting damn tired of hearing me rattle on, so maybe we need to, to have Don put in a few of, of his remembrances. Well, we worked there, um, Tommy Johnson, Kenny Erickson, Dwayne Erickson, myself, my brother. We worked there when we were in grade school. We were between the sixth and seventh grade uh, when we worked there. So we didn't get to drive the tractors or talk to the Mexicans or do any of these really neat things. We got, everybody got a little hoe about six inches long and we had to hoe the cabbages and onions and oh, all that stuff. Um, one time, none of us wanted to quit, but we thought, well, we'll get canned. That, that's an easy way out, because Dad wouldn't whale us too bad then. So we thought, okay. So in the afternoon, we were across the tracks over there where the interstate's at now, and that was all cabbage, the whole thing. And so we stood with our backs to it one day, 
and we thought, okay, we're going to lose our hose because Ben will fire us as soon as we lose our hose. So we turned our backs and just pitched them over our shoulders as far as we could. Of course, we couldn't find them, so we go back to the, across the highway and, and down to the wash house. And lo and behold, in drives, and this is just at the end of the day, six o'clock, well in drives a uh, Safeway truck. Well, we always had to load the Safeway truck and stuff, so we worked for about an hour extra, and oh, we got a great big, we got a quarter from Ben. So, oh geez, we thought we were in tall cotton then. So, oh God, we can't get fired now. So, four of us, back across the tracks over there, and we looked around, looked around, finally found our hose. And so we wouldn't get canned. But after that, um, we did some uh, weeding, but we must have done something right because uh, we got to work in a wash house most of the time after that. And wash the vegetables and, and pack them and, and get them ready for shipment. And this was all quite good. We'd always had our, of course there was a silver temple down there where they made the sauerkraut and stuff. Uh, let's see, Jerry Trowbridge, Cliff LePayne, they were a couple years older than we were. So they thought they were, and they were from over there by Franklin. So they thought they were pretty good, but we used to get in there and the four of us would be against the two of them and we'd have onion fights <laughs> at noon, so. But when we worked there, let's uh, see, Tommy Johnson worked the year before, he got a dollar and a half a day. And so the year we worked with him, uh, we got a real raise because we were getting two bucks a day. So we, oh, we were just in heaven. And we could ride from here, we could ride in with my dad in the mornings because he worked it as an electrician in town. Well, that was all fine, well, and good, except five o'clock he went home. Well, at six o'clock when we got off work, and I think Tommy and Ron and I, well, we had to thumb our way to Milltown at least. And uh, most of the time, we, although we did catch Lee Farrell quite often, we used to catch him sneaking back out of town, so he'd give us a ride to Milltown. But for the most part, and that was a long, hot summer, summer of 59. And so that's what I know about that. Okay. Great. The wash house where I spent a lot of my time. That was a long rectangular uh, building. It had a ditch run right through the middle of it, but it was wooden. The floor in that wash house was tapered towards the center. So when we would go out and pick up the radishes and onions that these gals had bunched, we would we place them in this ditch. Now this ditch had a, a end gate and a safety screen in the end in case the end gate slipped out the screen would still hold the produce. Okay, you dump it in there, you had these long brooms, bush brooms. You sponge them up and down real careful, and boy, Ben wanted them sponged carefully. We did have one gal out there, the Mexicans referred to her as La Coriana. She was a Korean gal who could go down a row of radishes like a whirlwind, but she didn't bunch them very good. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> so you get them in the wash house and you got all that stuff laying all over. And you got old Ben. One of the reasons he was so cranky, throwing a fit. Make her, scooped them all out one time, made her re-bunch re them. <laughs> but the Mexicans thought she was about the coolest thing that ever came along since chili pepper. So they, they were kind of, they, they thought she was just real special. But actually, she was kind of paid. Well, anyway, we would sponge these uh, radishes up and down in this water, and then we had a rock fork, which is an oversized pitchfork. 
and we would scoop the radishes out of this ditch, uh, one on each side. We'd get a pile, and when the when it was empty, the trough down the center of the wash house was empty. We'd pull the head gate, and then everything went down to the river. All accumulated dirt and all that. By this time, by the time we drained that and we would sweep the floor down, the radishes had dripped off the excess water, so then the packing process started. And we had the big packing crates when I was there. Uh, we lined those with a heavy wax paper. Uh, we'd run one piece of wax paper lengthways, one across the width. Then we'd take three dozen onion, or radishes, pack them with the red bulb down. We had ice boxes in there. We'd take a shovel of ice, sprinkle it over that first three dozen. The second three dozen was packed so that the red bulb was up. Then a sheet of wax paper placed in, some more ice, and the uh, same process was repeated. The third three dozen and then the fourth three dozen. At that time, the wax paper was folded over the top of the crates and a lid was nailed on and they were hauled into a cooler which was right next to the wash house. And by that time, it was time to start this process over again. So we jump in an old 49 Dodge pickup with what we call a field crate, which is a heavier version of the uh, radish crate. And out to the field we'd go. Sometimes we'd see these gals just at work in the beat hell out there. And sometimes we wouldn't find them around. I think Donna told me that on a real hot day, if they were close to the river, they like go down to that river and cool off. And <laughs> come back and work some more. So, Sometimes she went out there and there was a full crew of ladies working and sometimes they were down, you know, getting refreshed with this uh, cool water. The onions was a little bit of a different process. Uh, they munched uh, the uh, onions. I think you got, what, six cents a dozen bunches for the radish and onions. You know, so they had to really <coughs> lean into it to make a, a day's wage. And, and what was your average wage? $5 a day at the most. Yeah, if you didn't spend too much time in the river or waiting for the guy in the Dodge truck to come out, throw dirt claws at him and stuff like that. So <laughs> anyway, the onions was brought in, they were bunched up, brought in and they were dumped in this same trough in the center of the wash house. The white bulbous part of the onion faced downstream in that wash house, uh, I do have some diagrams here, was what we called an onion washer. It's a contraption that had two opposing rotating brushes. It was the width of this trough. In front of this machine, you laid a board down, then you got down on your knees, reached into the trough and grabbed as many uh, onion bunches as you could get a hold of, insert them into these brushes, which was frothing water, and also brushing and this would take the excess dirt off. Then you would lay them beside the trough. There would be two operators, one on each side of this machine. And when you got, got them all washed up, then you packed them. Uh, some of the more mature onions with the big, long, ragged tops, we would pack into the, to the uh, packing crates and take a machete and run along the top and cut them so they were kind of like a flat top haircut. A lot, of the, a lot of the stores preferred them that way. The younger onions at the start of the season were usually packed so that the top was intact. So that's basically how that wash house worked. <clears throat> Stir in a bunch of teenagers and a whole bunch of horseplay, and you had one interesting area to work in. When I first started working there, I did get a little extra in employment. We cut the ice from the river. So you could go down on a Saturday during weather like we're having now and go down there and wrestle those blocks of ice out. They stored them in an ice house. Later, he bought a shaved ice machine, which really made it simple. Plus, the ice spread out in those crates a lot nicer. Uh, when it comes to leaf lettuce and the more delicate products, boy, you had to be real careful with them. You just barely immerse them up and down in the water take them out gently and shake the water off because stores like Buttery's and Stop and Shop 
Safeway, they wanted a nice, crisp, fresh looking product out there that wasn't all mashed to hell because the people washing it were in the middle of a big wrestling match or something. So, Wash House was kind of the, the center of, of what went on out there. It's where the customers came to buy produce if they wanted small amounts. Some of the gals, I can remember coming down there to pick up cucumbers. Damn, some of these gals were fanatics. They wanted their pickle so long, so big around. And we had truckloads of them down there, and they'd want to go through every damn one for a dozen. So I got to the point to where, by this time, I had a pretty good suntan. And my hair was fuller then. It didn't all fall out. So I see one of those gals come in, <laughs> want pickles. And I would look at her. She'd come up to me and want to buy some pickles. And I'd say, por favor, senor, no comprendo inglés, solamente espanol. <laughs> and then I'd split. <laughs> Let somebody else do it. Got away with that for a while, the old cranky Ben caught on to what I was doing. Not funny. You get your butt out there, you pick her damn cucumbers. That's what I'm paying you for. So one of the one of the, the neat things about learning another language wasn't too good for Mrs. Boileau in, in uh, Hellgate High School. She wasn't too impressed with that. But it got me out of selling cucumbers to fanatics. Also you get them you you included a sprig of dill with the cucumbers. It's kind of a bonus thing. I think they were about 25 cents for a sprig of dill. Okay, other wash house should I? Oh, to learn the, the Mexican culture, I like to get in there and, and learn as much of the language as I thought I could, the right language, but also their customs, what they like to eat. Uh, they invited me into supper one night. And while I was waiting for them to prepare, prepare the supper, and they kept grinning and snickering amongst themselves, and I should have known then. But they had it out of water glass, smaller than this, with what I thought was Spanish peanuts. So I reached in and, and got me some peanuts, and I mashed down on them peanuts. It was some kind of pepper. They, I think they make bear spray out of that. They'd have to make it. <laughs> That was the hottest thing I ever been into in my life. And my eyes, I couldn't see no more. They were watering. I lost my breath. And they said, here, quick, have a drink of water. Give me some water. That wasn't water, that was tequila. <laughs> so when I realized how bad I'd been set up, <laughs> I spit. I mean, get this out of my mouth, it's too much to handle. Well, those cabins had wood cook stoves in them. Even though the top of the, the stove was closed, when I got rid of the contents in my mouth, some of it lit on the stove. And it went woof. And then burnt down to a blue flame about this tall. And by the time we got that out, dinner was what was supposed to be cooked, was totally ruined. The cabin smelled terrible. And I was never invited back again, so. <laughs> Mexican folks, they love their hot spices. And they also love big dummies to come along so they could set them up, which they did for me. Okay. What else about these stores was neat out there? You got free lunches. Oh, I got to tell you about the lunches. This is cool. <laughs> Shoveling the end product of an animal into a truck is really not that appetizing. And the fairgrounds generated piles of this stuff. So did rainbow stables, and there was, there was one out there at uh, oh God, Pleasant Holmes or, or one of them out there. I think Dale's Dairy. You know, we went to several areas because it took a lot of... I call it bull <laughs> for fertilizer. But anyway, at this time of year, about a month from now, it's time uh, we check with old Ben. Are you ready to start hauling? Oh, yeah. So, okay, let's let's get the truck and we'll go out to the fairgrounds. There's a whole bunch of it out there. 
So we go out to the fairgrounds, and of course, when March hits, you get a lot of wind. So we're loading up the truck. We are, we hauled one load, delivered it, went back on the second load. It's getting close to lunchtime. So right across, as you come out of the fairgrounds, I believe it's on to Brooks. There is a, it's still there, it's an A&W root beer stand. I think it's a Chinese restaurant now of some sort. Anyway, we would stop there with this big load of animal byproduct, which was mixed with a lot of wood shavings and on a windy day. <coughs> so we'd pull in there. <laughs> we would order the mom, you know, the Papa Burger, big root beer float, lots of French fries. And while they were preparing the order, the wind was blowing something terrible. And this product from the animals was getting over into the trays of the cars that had their windows rolled down, enjoying their lunch. So the owners would come out and say, now here, here's your stuff, it's in a brown sack, just take it, get out of here, there will be no charge. <laughs> that was my incentive to hurry up quick and get my driver's license, because I'm coming back here next year, and I'm gonna have some more free lunches. <laughs> That's how that worked. We panhandled that pretty good. We also had some pretty good panhandling going on behind the stores, South Side Safeway, uh, West Side Butteries. We would take an order, Ben would have an order ready for us, we'd load it up, take it over there. And we would time that so that we got there about the time Community Creamery arrived. Maybe there's a truckload of melons come in from Texas always a split one in there if there ain't you help it get split so we done a lot of horse trading got a lot of ice cream bars and all kinds of goodies split melons so lots of horse trading went on back there we had our own little beer hops we had our own little menagerie going back there the beer hop thing i was going to bring uh for those of you how many remembers the old highlander brewery okay I was going to bring a bottle. We do have one if you want to see what their labeling looked like. We've got a full one, thanks to Ed and Shirley. They brought a full one down. It's on display at, at the History Center. Okay, beer hops, like I mentioned earlier, that was good fertilizer. Rather odorous, but good fertilizer. Well, we go down there with this truck, steel bedded old 29 Chevy load up the beer ops, but you could go on the front side of that brewery and you could get these cans and bottles that was maybe overweight or underweight. And if you didn't get caught or you knew the right persons to talk to, you could get yourself a good sample of the beer. That's why I've got Red Solo Cup. Because <laughs> Ed back there. You grinning, Ed, because you helped tip a lot of these. <laughs> Red Solo Cup, I fill you up. Let's have a party. <laughs> That's why I brought the cup. But I was reluctant to bring the bottle in. A church, I don't think, would be quite the place to display a beer bottle. So it's down at the History Center if you want to see that. Okay, other good times at Hughes's. What else have we got? One, you got any favorite stories? Outside of throwing your hose away? <laughs> no, actually, um, I mean, we just hold. <laughs> we just hold. We were, we were really young, so we didn't get to do all these neat things that these old guys <laughs> got to do. And so, we were just kind of slave labor. Why did they give you such a short handle hold? Well, you don't, it's just like the railroad, you don't lean on it if it's short. <laughs> plus, plus it gets you closer to the weed so that you chop the weed and not the plant. Well, that was one of the lectures I got. Because I did chop quite a bit of plants and suffered the wrath of man for doing so. I think that's why I got moved to the wash house. <laughs> well, I probably have the record of the least topped onions there because we used to have to top those onions your hands would turn absolutely green and the smell 
from those onions would last on your hands for two or three weeks at least. But I think it was Bill Manthe was probably got mad at me and he sent me out to top some some of the bigger onions right by there was a little I think it was an agricultural building or something that set right is that right Mike that set right there just by the turn in to Hughes Gardens and right behind it was where they grew these that year they grew these big onions and so Manthe pitched out four or five big bushel baskets and and gave me the old clippers you know and said well top these onions well I wasn't doing a very good job because I just barely kind of clipped along and and I thought I was doing all right until his big foot landed in the in the bushel basket and smashed everything down then I wasn't doing so well but other than that I don't know Okay, it's time to pass the mic out to the audience. What I was else? I going to ask you, Glenn, what were some of the other produce they produced there besides the lettuce and tomato, onions and oh, radishes? Corn. Corn? Oh, corn. Yeah, corn what other corn. products did you grow there besides the radishes? Oh, peppers. Corn, peppers, cabbage. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Oh, very good tomato story to tell you. Asparagus. Asparagus. Mm -hmm. Dill spice. Leaf lettuce, like romaine, you know, the, the more decorative, more decorative lettuces. Uh, I don't think the head lettuce would grow that. that. Yeah, they tried head lettuce. We got a little bit of it, but that was a tough one. Yeah. I have two questions. One in your first segment, you mentioned you got a bonus. Do you recall how much that bonus was if you stuck out the season? Yeah, my first bonus was $75. That's pretty good. Wow. And then the second question is, in the peak of the season, how many people about would be working in that wash house? Let's see, Ben was a permanent fixture. He parked himself on an old scale that you raised spuds on. Then there was a packer for each side of the ditch. There was probably about four of us that run the wash house. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, did the Hughes Gardens sell only locally, or could they put produce on the train and ship it to another town? Yes, they did. It wasn't the train, though. It was refrigerated trucks. Well, I never did see, uh, history says that Hughes had their own refrigerated trucks. I never saw one. But we would pack it up <coughs> into one of his trucks. There was two Dodges out there, two Dodge trucks, ton and a half. There was Harry's truck and Ben's truck. Ben's truck was what usually hauled the heavier produce plus the animal byproduct. Harry's truck mainly transported the Mexican labor and all the tools to tend the fields. So what we would do is he would get an order. The most that I can remember the orders we put up was for Gamble Robinson, Bozeman, Billings, Dillon. We would load them on to his truck, take them down to Trio Fruit, and from there they were transferred on to the refrigerated over the road highway units that would take them to the other towns. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Ben would sit in that wash house a lot because he was, he would sit on that old scales and he'd write out the invoices for all these various orders that were shipped out to Billings, Bozeman, all over. So. Second question. Um, you mentioned you're invited to the cabin of this Mexican family. Were these cabins supplied by Hughes Gardens? And they were they near the fields? Or how were they housed? Yes, they were. I'm glad you brought that up. There's, there's another hooligan story I can tell. Jared Hirsch, he's around here someplace. He might remember some of these hooligan stories. Anyway, the cabins were, uh, there was a row of them down by the river. There was a couple of them in East Missoula, what they call Ben Hughes Edition. And as you turned into the Hughes Gardens, the main entrance, 
there was a large tomato cellar that sat right beside the entrance and then right next to that tomato cellar and the creek that fed the water to the wash house was the cabin where I had the heated discussion about what we ate. They appeared to me, those cabins, uh, I've seen early pictures, there were old log cabins hauled in. I don't remember those. What I remember is a little white frame type cabin. Looked like something that might have been salvaged from CCC camps or something on that order. There was just room enough for one or two occupants, a stove and beds. Their uh, produce that they ate, uh, their foodstuffs that they ate, was usually kept in the old ice house where we cut ice out of the river or it was kept in where we had the shaved ice. So, but they were real, real tight. Real, real small quarters. They have outhouses or the sweet pea? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, the old outhouse, that sat down by the river. And it was co-educational. So you just didn't go bust it in there when you had it, when the urge hit. So it wasn't, night, it wasn't night soil. The Asians call it night soil. <laughs> That's how you got the big radishes. <laughs> There's a lot of them went down there when they got washed down. If they, if there was some big radishes, I could see why as close as that outhouse was. <laughs> You're making me jiggle the camera. <laughs> it, it wasn't the Mexican families that came. It was just the men that came. Yeah. And the rest of the families all stayed wherever they lived and how Ben and, and Harry got those guys here I don't know if they bust them up or yeah. put them on trains or I don't know how they got them here but it was just the men that come up and they made the living through the summer and then they would feed their families all winter on that. Were the migrants allowed into the North Higgins bars? Yeah. That's where some of the money went. <laughs> Quite a bit of it, yeah. And then, of course, as teenagers, you know, I think we drank a lot of beer because we weren't supposed to. It was against the law. We had all the beer we could possibly drink because we would go down and get one of the Mexican laborers to go into Warden's Market, <laughs> Frank, <laughs> and load us up on beer. Of course, a lot of our beer in the early days went to a place that's only known to a few of us. The Reverend O'Lean knows one place called Woodchopper's Cabin. Where's Bill Walker? Did he ever make he it here? He didn't make it. Oh, well. He, he drank a lot of, of uh, that ill-gotten beer up there at Woodchopper's. Uh, <laughs> some more shenanigans that we pulled. Uh, my wife brought some up. Jared might remember some of these shenanigans. Uh, we cruised the drag a lot. Missoula was a town with brick streets. Let it rain a little bit, and I don't care if you had a Studebaker six-cylinder or what. You could lay a patch of rubber on them bricks and the rain wouldn't quit. If you had a flathead Ford with straight pipes, you were the king. Go out on the drag, cruise the drag, mouthing off to each other, you know, having a good time, you know, enjoying life. And then the city police, in their infinite wisdom, bought Nash Ramblers as patrol cars. <laughs> now, for a guy that loves a good flathead Ford straight pipes, this is just about too dang gone much to handle. So we'd find one parked along Higgins Avenue, stop beside him and rev the engine up, you know, blot them pipes off, and holler at him to get the chase. Well, they'd take the bait, and off we'd go. We'd head out of town to Hughes' Gardens. Now, Hughes' Gardens, uh, there were a lot of irrigating roads and stuff back in there. So if you knew where those roads were, you could lose the police in hot pursuit real easy. And in sometimes, some cases, they would miss a turn, and an irrigated field is just not a place to put a city patrol car, which some of them wound up out of the, in a field. <laughs> so, we uh, we would usually, when we cruise the drag, 
We would run down through Hughes Gardens and honk the horns past those Mexican cabins, scream and holler, and just be belligerent. Make a loop through, come back through the second time, do the same thing all over again. Well, they decided they'd had just about enough of this. So they got a bunch of railroad ties one night, they put them right beside their cabin. We come tearing through there, the cops are on our, right on our bumper, breathing hard down our necks. We get past them, they figure we'll catch them on the return loop, threw the railroad ties out, and the Nash Rammer and the city policeman went right over the top of the ties. So, between the city police, the sheriff's department, the border patrol, anybody wearing a badge by the time they got out there and investigated all of it, we were long gone. Hiding. You remember those nights, George? <laughs> Who else does? Jim? Okay, sorry, I didn't see you. I was wondering if the Mexican laborers were from Mexico or from, you know, migrants in the U.S. already, do you think? I think we had a few uh, U.S. Mainly they were from uh, across the border because they had to fill out their paperwork and stuff. Some of them are real conscientious of not offending us. And others, as we worked with them, they became, we became kind of like a, between the Mexicans and us, a culture all of our own. You didn't speak perfect Spanish. They didn't speak perfect English. But at noon hour, we would have basketball games out in front of the parking garage, right in front of the wash house. It was unbelievable. Uh, we did, if there had been a referee, he would tore his hair out and left. Because we wrestled, we screamed, we talked to each other, conversed with each other quite well. Name calling, hooting and hollering. But we had some of the dank on us basketball games you can imagine out there. And some of those boys were good. They were damn good basketball players. So we had a great time out there with them, even though <laughs> I didn't know half of what they were saying. I know they didn't. I did recognize some of the names, like, well, I can't repeat the names they called me, but, you know, instead of somebody going for a layup, you don't just block that shot. You, you put some football tactics in there and you take him off his feet, you know, that sort of thing. So you know, it was quite a, 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 quite a culture to live and work under. At least I thought so as a kid. That was right up my alley. Judy has a question. Oh, I've got a couple questions, actually. One is, I'd like to have Sharon explain how the radish picking went, because I've heard that story, and it's really interesting. <laughs> and then the second question, after she's finished, uh, anybody, how did they irrigate the gardens? Okay. Let me grab the irrigating one down. It was gravitational uh, water flow. And old Ben had a knack. You never seen that man without a hole in the back of his truck. Okay, and, and in the fields, beside each row of uh, uh, radishes or onions or whatever need to be irrigated, usually you found about a, a, a melon-sized rock and a good heavy piece of sod. And of course, he would tap into the main water source and spill out some of the water that he needed for a particular patch. Then he regulated that flow of water by positioning this big rock to allow the, uh, I tried it once, it flooded the place. But, and then he relieved me of my irrigating duties and he took over. But he had a piece of sod that he would place beside the rock, which would further reduce that flow or increase that flow of water to the desired amount of water he felt he needed. There was only one uh, one patch out there that was sprinkler irrigated, and that was that was my job. One of them there, he paid me extra to come in and change those sprinkler pipes. That patch was located, and it's still part of it is there. It's between the condos that's out there. I think it's kind of like a park now. Yeah, that was full of sand. And it grew a carrot in there as big as straight as an icicle. But you couldn't flood irrigate that by the way it flowed into the river and the way the water come into it. So you had to sprinkle that. So it was an electric powered uh, 
sprinkler pump, you had to go down and, and prime the pump. And once it was primed, then you hit the start buttons for the main pump to suck the water out of the river. The, uh, the other uh, water source in East Missoula, out where the Ben Hughes addition is now, there was a huge, huge pump out there that draw water up from the river into the ditches where it was flood irrigated, what needed to be flood irrigated there. So most of it, uh, the water come out of the rattlesnake, I believe, and uh, we, we the river for the two sprinkler systems. Okay, Dennis? You can see on old Highway 10 as you're going in, you can still see the concrete siphon where the ditch used to cross the highway. Oh, that's it's, right, yeah. It's still left there along the highway. It used to be all wood flumes along the railroad track yeah. there, too. Yeah. I was wondering about uh, the exact location for the headquarters and the offices and the layouts and where everything was. And also about how many total people would there be per summer working there? About 50? Yeah, I'd say 50, what did you say? About 50, 60? I'd say 50, 50. About 50. <clears throat> His, uh, Ben's office was a dang honest thing. It looked like a piece of the movie set from Dances with Wolves. It was an old rundown cabin. At one time had a dirt roof. In fact, I think it had a dirt roof when I was there. Yeah, the dirt floor. And uh, inside was the dag goddess menagerie of papers and junk. He knew where everything was, but to walk in there, it was like walking into a time capsule. Anything from the 1800s to when I worked there was strewn around in this ramshackle old cabin. Right next to it was a spare tool shed where the broken tools and stuff were thrown, they were kept there until you could repair them in the winter time. Uh, coming up from that complex there was uh, some storage sheds for, for crates, packing crates, and also we kept a display of cucumbers in that particular shed, and with the cucumbers we kept sprigs of dill for the ladies that like to can their pickles. Then there was a shed that, that held an ice machine that made the shaved ice. And uh, eventually we got a pop machine. Mm -hmm. Royal Crown Cola, man, we were cool. We had Royal Crown Cola out there. We wouldn't quit. We gotta hear Sharon's story about that now. Okay. Sharon. Yeah, I love this. She said she wants to go talk. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> Speaking of Royal Crown Cola, We'd sit out in that in the fields, bunching radishes, and when the guys would come out to collect our bunches, they would ask us if anybody wanted anything to drink, water or pop or whatever. But after they got these machines, we said, yeah, we want some Royal Crown. And they come in these real nice big bottles. And so we'd give the guys money, and they'd go in and, and get our soda. Well. They brought one out, or they brought our, all our soda out, and in one of these bottles, we went to open it, and here was this cat-faced spider in the top of this bottle had been canned in this bottle of pop. And I don't think today I have ever drank an RC Cola. <laughs> I am terrified of spiders, and why we didn't run into them sitting out in those radish patches, I have no idea. But I think every kid in East Missoula, one time or another, sat in those fields bunching radishes. Didn't we, Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> and we would get six cents a dozen for bunching radishes, and we would scoot along on our butts in these rows, and we'd grab a bunch, we had the string down our shirts, and we'd pull that string out, and wrap it around twice and tie it and then you'd break it with your little finger and it would cut into our fingers the first day or two that we was there so then we finally got to wear gloves and 
the sun would beat down on us so severely and just fried us something terrible, our shoulders and, and arms and face. And so when we'd get home at night, my mom used good old Siegel milk. And she put on my shoulder and my arms and my face and stuff. And after she put that on, it was pretty sticky to start with. But then it would dry and get kind of hard. But we never did blister. So what was in that Siegel milk, I have no idea. But it was the best lubricant you ever want to put on a burnt kid. Siegel milk. What is that? It's a canned milk. And you can't find it nowadays. And my mom, she made the deep fried chicken that Herndon's have. She was the starter of that deep fried chicken. And that was one of the ingredients that she used was the seagull milk for dipping the chicken in for this batter. But it was really good stuff to put on sunburns. And we would sit there for hour after hour, bunching all these radishes with the string. And when we got to the green onions, we had twist ties. Joyce, do you remember where we kept those twist ties? I don't remember either, but I know we, we could twist those bunches up really fast with the twist ties. But you had to be careful because if you twisted it too tight, you'd whack the green onions in half. How, about, how many radishes did you bunch? How did you keep your tally of radishes? We would put a dozen bunches right beside us, and then we'd scoot along and leave a little space and then we'd put another dozen bunches and when the guys would come out to pick them up we would stop and we'd count how many bunches stacks or whatever you want to call it so we could keep track of that tally because at the end of our shifts we would have to write them on a board in the greenhouse or in the wash house so Ben would know how much to pay us at the end of the week and when we would tell him how many we made how much money we made we also had to figure out how much taxes was taken out of our checks. He wouldn't do it. You had to figure it out yourself. And if it wasn't right, he had a calculator there, and if he didn't think it was right, he'd make you go back out and refigure it. Because he wasn't going to pay any more taxes than what he had to, and he wasn't going to give you any more money than what you were entitled to. Yes? Where exactly were these gardens? I'm picturing uh, where the university wants to build a new college of technology. That was exactly where, that was part of it. It went all the way through the Hellgate Canyon on both sides of the frontage road and then across the railroad tracks where the freeway now runs, he also had gardens. So some of it's under the interstate now? Yep, yep. Is there any historic interpretive signage or do you plan any? talk about that garden? Well, there is one little spot between a couple of the apartment buildings out there that they've got a little park type of thing that people go down and, and walk their dogs and stuff. And I'm hoping someday, I don't know how to go about it myself, but maybe somebody knows. I would like to get some kind of a board up there that tells, or that shows pictures and the maps and stuff. And keep some of this historic stuff going because it's something that we need to teach our children and our children's children because otherwise it's going to be a forgotten, you know, well, why did Missoula get named the Garden City? Well, Ellen Baumler at the Montana Historical Society is a good woman to help you out on that. Because I, I, would, I would really like to see something go in there because there isn't much left of that Hughes's Gardens area. Um, I, I want to thank you all for organizing this and you all for sharing your remembrances today. It's great, thank you. Um, I'm curious about how agriculture in general um, changed in the Missoula Valley after the Second World War and then in particular, why did they sell Hughes Gardens? What was the community conversation around that? If anything, what, what were people's reactions when that uh, shift occurred, uh, as it occurred elsewhere in the country, obviously? 
Well, I'd be hard pressed to answer that one. Uh, I can only give my personal uh, interpretations. Ben at that time was getting up there in age. Shouldn't say that because David, he's close to my age when he quit. <laughs> In fact, we were, we've been married 54 years. I think Ben tallied up 53 or 54 years. I think they just wore out. Uh, I did find out from Bill Matthews' wife that Harry, that's Ben's brother, died at the gardens. They found him face down in the carrot patch. So what I'm thinking is that garden, if they would have had to break, I think Bill Matthews would have probably continued to run that and I think it would evolved to where it could still be an operation. I'd like to think that because today, you know, we're seeing the American public kind of tipping towards organic produce rather than the stuff that we feel is being contaminated with, with uh, stuff that it shouldn't be contaminated with. But the actual motivator for that to be shut down, I don't know. I was hoping to, at one time to meet with Elsie, that's Ben's wife. She was, she stayed there at that rest home, just right there on the gardens, Riverside. Yeah. I wanted to talk to Elsie because she was a great lady. She was hilarious, but I never had a chance to, and I kicked myself for not taking the time to talk to her to find out exactly what you've asked me. So I. That's about the best I can do on that one. Lee. I just want to say one thing. My own opinion mostly, I mean, the reason it went out is the price of real estate is getting higher and higher. And then when you call like urban sprawl and it's close to Missoula and everything, you just had to keep spreading out and spreading out. And that's basically. Yeah. Political money talks, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. It seems like stores started to bring food in from other places, too, and it was just like no one wanted food that was <coughs> locally grown or something like that. I mean, I never ate locally grown food when I was a kid. Yeah, we, uh, during the winter months, it was shipped in. You know, Buttrey's, Safeway, uh, they, they shipped it a lot in. But when Ben started putting produce out, we had quite a collection of folks that love that garden fresh stuff. Now, being that I've been retired, I've been retired for quite a while, uh, Sharon and I have our own greenhouse. We raise quite a bit of our own uh, stuff that we eat. And I tell you, there is, you take a cherry tomato that's imported up out of California, I don't care how fast that truck was. It ain't nothing like stepping out your back door, picking a fresh cherry tomato and eat it. The flavor is totally different. It's worth the effort. Yeah. Did they ever have a roadside fruit stand at the garden there or not? No, that was, that was the wash house. That, uh, you could go down to the wash house and uh, if we didn't have it ready in the wash house, we could send somebody out to the field. And uh, depending on what you wanted, we'd go get it for you. Uh, from your conversation, we hear about Ben, so we're kind of guessing that Ben was the ramrod, but he had a brother. What was the brother's? Okay, the brother's name was Harry. Harry was uh, ex-military. I kind of think maybe that's why he took care of the Mexican labor. He knew how to, you know, if he was an NCO or above in the service, he would have had some kind of leadership skills there in order to, he could, he could converse with them. And he took care of the fields, all the weeding, the hoeing, uh, Spring of the year, we go out with him and his crew when they pick asparagus. The Mexicans would go through them with a tool that looks something like what you cut a dandelion root with, cut the asparagus and lay it in a little pile. We would follow in behind with a little wooden, square wooden basket, and we would pick these up and then take them to the truck to be brought into the wash house where they were packaged up into, I think, one pound bundles with the blue rubber band around them. And uh, they were sold that way locally and then packed for out-of-town sales. Was he, was he part owner of that or just was Ben, ben on and all? 
Uh, ben and Harry owned it together. And um, Bill Matthew, I'm not sure how he fit in. We called his wife up. She's still alive. And his daughter. Unfortunately, they have some medical issues that they're currently dealing with. And uh, they were unable to make it. If we could have got Dorothy and Darlene here, boy, we could have we could have had the finishing touches to answer a lot of your questions there. Yeah. Did they start the gardens? Yes, I believe uh, Ben's uncle started that, and then he got a hold of them and convinced them to go in with him. I believe Harry might have been in the service at the time. Ben in turn contacted. Harry. It was in 1939, I think they said. Yeah, it was. It was quite a while ago. How yeah. many acres was it? Boy, I <coughs> now what? Somebody I, said a hundred. It, it when I went. It went all the way from the uh, motel right there, all the way, took in Easy Street, went all the way down that side went down on the other side of the, the old highway all the way down the tracks to where just before Easy Street had ended and you can still see the ditches along there and then all the way from the Rattlesnake all the way down to East Missoula where the interstate is and so it was a it was a big area. When I talked with Mrs. Manthe yesterday she said there was a hundred plus acres all in gardens. Yeah. So do you think it provided most of the produce in Missoula? <clears throat> I think it provided a good share of it. Uh, the one thing that, uh, that I did notice, uh, and I noticed it here in our Victory Gardens, a, a lot of the, the folks in Missoula at that time liked to process their own vegetables from their own gardens, and that's what carried them through, through the winter months. <coughs> You know, and I was kind of worried that, that the art of that one might be lost. So I stopped over at uh, Donna and Frank's one day. I wanted to find some information on Donna's granddad. And I brought this topic up to her. Do you think we're losing the skills to run a pressure canner or a hot bath canner? And of course, Donna, she kind of smiled at me. She went back into her pantry, came out with a bottle of pickled beets that she had processed. Of course, I had those for, I believe, Thanksgiving that year for our condiment tray. So, when it got to Donna's generation, it was still remembered. I think Donna might still process some food. Part of our summer vacations, uh, our summer months, I get my granddaughters and my daughters together, and we process a lot of stuff in our house with the old pressure canners and the, the hot bath things. So that was a tradition in Missoula, I think, to do that. And I was kind of concerned today we might be losing this because we got a lot of families out here that are kind of hard pressed and they'll go down and get food stamps and stuff. But times was difficult, not that difficult, but they were tough when we were young but yet we grew up in an environment where the, our moms processed a lot of this stuff to kind of ease the burden on the grocery bill and things that we couldn't, couldn't have. I see Shirley in the background there, her mom put up huge amounts of stuff. You never mentioned Bitterroot Market as one of the produce places. Oh yeah, uh, produce like fruits. They had fruits and vegetables. Yeah, they had both. The fruits, because you can't you can't live just on uh, the vegetables. They did have some really good fruits there, and that was part of the tradition out here too. Was Canada preserves, uh, peaches, pears, uh, jellies. The, uh, the Bitterroot Market was one of the art staple places that we went, where my mother bought all of her fruit every year. She knew exactly what day it was going to come in there, and she went and bought uh, all of her fruit for the year and put it up. Yeah. And uh, now, like you were talking about the 
vegetables going to Safeways and Buckery's, Missoula also had a lot of small stores. Mm -hmm. Ward Market was <coughs> one where I worked. Yes, that's true. And uh, they, like, uh, after they got through at Buckery's or delivering at Safeways, if bunches were broke, then they would bring them over to Wardens or one of the other small stores and sell them to them. So they didn't have to take anything back to the gardens. They were all, it was, the truck was empty when it went back mm -hmm. to the it's gardens. True. And uh, they sold it, you know, like the better potatoes were, would go to the bigger stores. <coughs> wardens would get the potatoes with the little knobs on them and stuff like that. But they did manage to sell all, all of their uh, vegetables <coughs> throughout the whole summer. Yes, they did. I think they raised uh, <coughs> pumpkins too, didn't they? Oh, a lot of pumpkins, a lot of squash. Pumpkins and squash. <coughs> big, some of them Hubbard squash, man, that's all you can do is pick one up. 45 pounds. Yeah, big, heavy things. So, uh, what else? Do I need to tell them how bad he hated me when we first started out? <coughs> <laughs> She's got a question. Oh, go ahead. Just one last question. I think in some of that area is being kind of um, shady. Because, um, you know, it, the sun gets cut off by the mountains there. Was that not a problem? No. No, the way, the way that was situated, it worked. It's fine. Yeah. But we did have to set out our pepper plants. We grew them in a hotbed. I've got a diagram of a hotbed I drew up over here. And I think I talked a little bit of how to get one started. Yeah, when would you start it? We would start that about March. Because we'd call up Ben and he'd say, you ready to start hauling into the hotbeds? And he'd say, yeah, we're, we need to go to this dairy or that stable. And uh, first time, I, like I mentioned, first time I did that, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Nothing smells so bad in my life as to get down there and start turning that stuff. But it produced a hell of a plant. We did have a problem one time with, uh, you can get those hotbeds too hot. And we had a problem called black root with our tomatoes. I think it was a little too hot for this, the root, so we'd lose a lot of them. But what survived put out a huge crop of tomatoes. Gave us enough extra tomatoes. Here's a hooligan story. Gave us enough extra tomatoes. We had a patch right alongside the railroad track. Northern Pacific come roaring through there with a bunch of bums hanging out, clapping our hands, wanting a tomato. We would save all the sun splits we could get our hands on. And when the train come through and the bums hung out, we would melt <coughs> tomatoes to those bums. We had one old fellow there. He was dripping with seeds so bad that he fell off the boxcar. <laughs> so that was great fun, but that was what gets done back in those days. That reminds me of another question. Seeds, where did they get the seeds? Did they keep their own or get bring them in? Who is that? The seeds for the vegetables. Yeah, Ben brought those in. They came, they're not like our little packet of 79 cent seeds we buy here. They came in bags. They looked like bags of shotgun pellets. Big bags. And it, what motivated him to buy the type of seed he did, I'm not too sure about. He must have had some horticulture experience to know what grew well in the canyon. But all I can remember when uh, they'd bring a, a seed shipment in, or we'd offload those and we kept them in a, a cellar until it was time to plant either the hotbeds or the radish patch or the seed, seeds for the onions. But that was all his choice. And, you know, as a kid, uh, we were just talking about, you never think of ask those kind of questions when you're a kid. You're more interested in how many tomatoes can you throw at a bum on a boxcar <laughs> in a 100-foot run. <laughs> Jim. Jim. I know they tried to grow uh, tomatoes, I mean, uh, watermelon <coughs> and cantaloupe there. Didn't that work out? Or? Yes, that was behind... Uh, yeah, right behind the parking garage. There was a hotbed back there. They started the uh, watermelon and the cantaloupe in. Cantaloupes did fairly well. Watermelon never, there's nothing like what we get up out of Texas. Or, 
the southern states. Also in that, uh, I get back to tell another hooligan story. It's not a hooligan story. This is a, a Squire Hughes story. Squire loved his beer. He liked his home brewed beer. He brewed it right there on, uh, in our lunchroom. Two occasions I can remember, he put something in there he shouldn't have. Because there was this popping sound, and when we went in there, there's this huge ocean of orange colored foam and bottle caps come oozing out the door. So whatever he brewed up, made a hell of a mess back there. But old Squire did love, did love his booze, or his beer. I was wondering, did you only plant onion seed, or did you plant onion sets, too? Maybe the seed. The sets was a different, uh, different type of onion, and that's what the gals here would, would uh, he would send out a digger to loosen them because they grew into the dirt something terrible. They would loosen them up and they would bunch the tops off and we would spread those into drying trays. In a summer where we didn't have much rain, you know, it's very dry summer, we would stack these crates up with a thin layer of uh, onion sets. The bottom had slats together that worked tight, would let the air flow. We would stack them up in such a way that the air could flow through them and then periodically we would go out and turn them. Uh, the bars liked a lot of those pearl onions, we call them. Yeah. Uh, I think what they mixed them in a drink of some sort. Don said that he would go out and get the big onions where the, the, the kid labor like Joyce and I and, and the rest of us, we, they would put us out there and we would cut the little pearl onions. <clears throat> we'd have these big shears and we'd have to cut them off and we'd have to put them in these bushel baskets. And Ben was such a tightwad that the baskets we had were always full of holes. So we'd try to line those holes a little bit with some grass, which we got in trouble for because we were shorting him his bushel baskets of onions. <coughs> but we'd get a, a quarter a basket. So we, we'd bunch all these onions, cut the tops all off, throw the tops away, and, and just keep the, the pearl. And we would fill up a bushel basket, and we'd get a whole quarter. And that was big money for a bunch of kids. Yeah, I think they were what they called a half bushel basket. Yeah. Now they were pretty big for a kid. Yeah. Fill one up full of pearl onions, yeah, that would be a chop. We also had what we called an onion drying shed out there. We didn't have to use it much. It was built like a smokehouse. The crates of uh, the onion was put up on the top. There was a stove in the bottom of flues that went up to take the heat up. Because some years, I think the first winter or first summer I worked in Houston, rained every gosh damn day in June. I sat out on a tractor and turned into a fungus for <laughs> Come in a night, scrape me off the seat. <laughs> Not that bad, but mighty. Um, you had mentioned something about the labels, which I think is interesting, because they're, they're, there's not much that we have today, apparently, left from the gardens, except for one or two of the labels, one of which the Historical Museum has. But will you explain why he, did, he didn't use many labels? I think the labeling problem was uh, the expense. He preferred, uh, whenever we went to Southside Safeway or any of the big stores that ordered a lot of produce, he was satisfied with using the packing crate that they would normally discard. So that could be some grower out of California. And what we would do with, with a crate like that some of them you could put labels on, but he never had many of the paper labels glued on. He was just happy to scribble off what was on there and staple on. I believe we have some invoices here of Hughes Brothers. Staple that on, and as far as Ben was concerned, that's good enough. So, but he did those crates that he brought home by the time, or brought back to his gardens, by the time they were shipped up from California, the nails became loose in them. And we would have to tighten those up with hammers, pound them in tight. In some cases, they would be broken boards. And in a way, 
Hughes Gardens and the box factory here at Bonner work together because a lot of the repair boards for those packing crates came from the box factory here at Bonner. So he used a lot of those. I remember one time he went down to get, I think, some lugs for lettuce. He reached up into a pile and there was enough yellow jackets in that pile. That by the time he got out of there, they stung him so bad we had to take him to the hospital. But uh, we used a lot of our own crates. The packing crate was a little bit lighter in construction as compared to a field crate. Field crates is what we used to go out and pick up the gals, radishes, and onions with. They were a heavy, because we used those pretty good. But the, once we shipped them out, no telling where they went after that. Probably some tight one market garden or somewhere else, tightened the nails up, loaded them up, and shipped them back to us. Oh, I know. <laughs> How long did each of you guys work there? I worked there just two years. How long were you there, Joyce? Probably about two, sure. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? I was there two. Two? Just yeah. one year. Just one year? Yeah. Most people couldn't handle it. It couldn't take much more than that. Well, yeah. sitting out in that hot sun, it was hard on it, but I, I, I enjoy being outside, so. And, and once you got the first initial day or two of burning, then you kind of got used to it. And mm -hmm. So, yes, Kim. Um, speaking of the origin of the Garden City, um, I think a number of people have gone looking for when it was first called Bar Garden City, and it looks like the first one, and I, I may not have my dates exactly right, but back in the 1860s, um, there were a, a couple of brothers named McCork, M-C, capital W-H-I-R-K, who had uh, flower and vegetable gardens alongside Rattlesnake Creek. Um, as I understand it, it was right by where Burger King and Taco Bell and that area are now. And um, the Rocky Mountain husbandman out of White Sulphur Springs had a reporter going through Montana um, in the mid 80s after the railroad came through, if I've got my dates correct, and he referred to those gardens as the very garden of Montana and when Missoula was, was there. So that goes. <coughs> goes back to the 1880s in terms of wow. the first yeah. reference. That's interesting. Uh, one more. Did you ever see Ben laugh? And if so, what made him laugh? <laughs> I never saw him laugh. <laughs> you got a good point there. I never did either. <laughs> we pulled a lot of shenanigans on him that should have made him laugh, but it just made him grumpier. I, should, I think he was grumpy because he had to deal with a bunch of Ragtag kids who thought the whole world was funny. Let's pull a shenanigan on somebody. You know. So I guess I got to cheat and ask one more. Kids being what they are, and kids uh, back then being what they were, and him having this nice garden, did he post a guard at night or anything? No, no. He never did that I know of. He approached me one night, I think the folks from East Missoula, I'm not pointing my fingers. No, definitely not. Because I married one and she knocked my head flat. But I think a lot of their Sunday get-togethers in the backyard, I think the corn on the cob that they enjoyed came from the gardens. All they had to do was hop over the railroad tracks at 10 o'clock on to midnight. And there, there, there's most of their dinner for the next day. So a lot of East Missoula kids, where's Jard? You ever do an A.L.? My brother was telling me a story that him, my two oldest brothers had gone down and was helping themselves and I don't know who come through the gardens but they got caught and everybody ran except my oldest brother and he laid down and tried to hide in the corn patch and they caught him and they told him that 
Whatever you've got picked, you take it and you get your butt out of here and don't ever come back. <coughs> and that was the only time that I know of the kids ever got caught. <laughs> Did you ever get caught, George? <laughs> <laughs> George could <can> run. <laughs> Were you with Dale and Keith at the time they got caught? No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> you wouldn't admit it anyway, would you? No, 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 no. The yep. reason I asked about the watermelon, I've never seen a watermelon grow, and so I think a, a Marvin or Mervin White worked there, and he, yeah, White. Me, and he took me down there to see the, on a Sunday, to see the watermelon growing. Well, here comes Hughes, and boy, he was mad. He thought we were going to steal the watermelon, I think, and uh, he started chasing us up on Mount Jumbo, and I don't know how far we went around Jumbo, but he was an old man, and I was hoping that he would quit running because I was tired. <laughs> but he chased his way up the hill. Um, the question that you talk about Ben being kind of stingy and grumpy, and there's an article, which it didn't mean anything to me, but it does now, uh, from Joe Rainbolt's book about the history of the Missoula Valley, and there's a reprint of it over on the table. And in their later years, it, it was Elsie, and Elsie been, was they liked to go on uh, cruises, and they all and they always went first class, and so that doesn't. I guess he was saving up when he was working. <laughs> you know, I, was I, I think you're right, and you know I don't like to speak ill of Ben. He he was cranky, but I think that was one of the reasons he was squinching that money to go on these cruises because what was one of his favorite sayings if you you know go first class if you're going to New York go to New York don't stop in Chicago so he was the type of guy so when I sit there when I sit here and say yeah Ben was kind of crotchety if he's got family out there I hope they don't hold this against me and realize yeah he probably was but he was good hearted nevertheless is this being recorded it's got to be <laughs> um, a lot of us kids we'd eat tomatoes till we got sick yeah. but I don't know if we were even supposed to eat them I don't remember it and I don't think we ever ate radishes oh, I can no. see why you know I, I never remember a sample of any of that stuff you know we were just too busy nattering amongst us and bunching radishes as fast as we could go and yeah, but you guys lived in mountains of radishes. I, I didn't, yeah. I didn't want to eat them after that. <laughs> and then when we'd make sauerkraut, if we cut ourselves, the batch got thrown away. I never did cut myself, so I, I don't know. Some of them did. Yeah, the knives that we used to cut sauerkraut, Ben did try to, to purchase a cabbage cutter knife. It looked like a big meat cleaver, but he ground the edges off. They look more like a paddle you, you discipline a kid with. But they were sharp. If you got to goof around there, you couldn't, you couldn't get cut. How about the other tools? Did he, he obviously provided all your tools. Were there any specialty tools that you used? Yes. Uh, his original cucumber sorter looked, it looked like a child's swing, but without the flat part where the child slides down. In place of that was slats spaced at different widths. Up on top where the child would crawl up the ladder and sit on the slide, you would dump a bushel of cucumbers up there. Then you would grab the sides of this thing and bang them into a stop and it would trickle. The time it bumped, it would trickle a few cucumbers down and they would continue to trickle down until they found a slat big enough to drop through. And then of course underneath that we had boxes for the various sizes. It started out a little bitty sweet pickle top on top and then of course down on the bottom you had the big wide ones for those big pick or, uh, dill pickles. And some of them was so big they'd almost be yellow. Those were the kind I like is get one on a stick man. Dill pickle on a stick and that was hard to beat. Another homemade machine he had kind of if anybody here has seen uh, Gold Rush, the gold trowels that they use, we washed a lot of carrots and a machine looked just like that, but it was made out of ribs 
off wooden spoke cars. They took the spokes out. They used a bunch of these rims, and there was uh, boards, probably one by fours, that held this all together like a big round trommel. And then uh, there was off the tread of a car tire was nailed onto the inside of those boards to keep the vegetable from being cut up, banged up too bad. It in turn rotated real slow and a spray of water went through there. It was placed at an angle so that when you loaded it, they tumbled through this round trommel <coughs> with the water spraying on it and come out clean on the bottom end. That was all homemade. His onion dryer was homemade. His transplanting machines that he put on the little Alice Chalmer tractors, they were homemade. A Mexican would sit, labor would sit on each side of one of these things with tomato plants in the middle. As he drove down the field, the little cultivator <coughs> made the ditch and put the mark to where the tomato plant had to be placed. And they would, each Mexican on each side of this machine, would put those in place. So that was homemade. A lot of his cedars for the seed beds for radishes was homemade. That's why I think Bill Matthew was such a remarkable man in so much as he designed a lot of this stuff. And he used it in such a manner that if you got up on the side of Mount Jumbo to look down on a clear day to see the water reflected out of those irrigated fields, it was a beautiful sight. I really enjoyed looking at that. You know, one thing that Hughes' Gardens might have back in history is when they were plowing those fields and stuff, they were running into different things that the Indians had left behind. And from what I understand, Harry had kept a lot of this stuff in cans and stuff that he, and whatever happened to that, I don't have any idea, but the Indians used to camp there before the gardens ever went in, so there's a lot of souvenirs that had been <coughs> lost there. Yeah, Willie, Willie. about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was a big ambush ground years and years ago. But the Blackfeet there would lay and wait up on Mount Jumbo and they'd get the, the flathead and the Salishan. That was an off battleground in there. I was just wondering if anybody that worked there ever found any arrowheads or spear points or anything. I know Ben must have found them all because he he had a garage full of that stuff yeah. up there. Mm. Yeah, I think Harry had the biggest collection, but I don't know whatever became of it. Yeah, he had bones and arrowheads, spear points, broken stuff, good stuff. Mm. It was all... Yeah, that was a big ambush ground in there at one time, at various times. Didn't they have an, um, an auction sale of, of the stuff that was left behind? I don't know. I don't know. I stopped in there one morning to get some stuff from my mom, uh -huh. and there was a spear point about that one. Perfect. Oh Laying up there in the radish house, there in the wash house. Okay. Ben come in there and ask him where he found that. He says, up early this morning, went up to change the water. He found it down along the ditch. So he says, I got some more stuff at home. He says, if you want to tell me up, he says, I'm going home to dinner. So I drove up to where I lived up there. He had coffee cans of stuff. Coffee, yeah. Whatever becomes of it, I don't know. Um, everybody should know that uh, we raided Stan Cohen last week for this, and most of these pictures that we've got here came out of Stan Cohen's collection. So we have a good collection of Hughes <coughs> Gardens pictures. Okay. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, Hughes' gardens. I feel bad that we didn't bring up a little bit more about our old Victory Gardens. But they, they went out, uh, boy, about the mid-50s. 
one thing, and, and I, I keep looking at Ed back here, and finally I said, I can't resist this anymore. We flew kites down there as kids because there was nothing there to tangle a kite up in. But the champion kite flyer of the Bonner Victory Gardens is sitting in the back row down here. He could, he could put up a kite up through those different air currents. You could see that kite climb up there. We tried to get one up as high as what Ed could put him up, but we never could. So that, when I think of Bonner Victory Gardens, this time of year, well, about March, uh, Ed comes to mind as pumping a kite up there like nobody else could put that kite up there. So I had to let that one out, Ed. <laughs> Down. Well, thank you all for coming. I think we've all learned a tremendous amount about the Hughes Gardens and uh, oh,